deforestation is one of the most serious environmental issues that keep increasing by the day. From 1990 to 2000, Sri Lanka lost an average of 26,800 hectares of forest per year. Um, so, Professor Devaka, how has deforestation affected wildlife and what impact has it had on rare species such as leopards and how has it impacted the bird population, especially migratory birds? And tell us why, what you think should be changed and why you think this is happening. Thank you, Dina. That's a fairly broad question. Let me try and answer it this way. What you see here is how uh, Sri Lanka's forest cover has changed over time. Uh, because uh, initially all our settlements were first in Anuradhapura, then in Polonnaruwa, then we switched switch to wet zone. And so the dry zone forests, which were under civilization, recovered. And so what you see here is in 1956, just after independence, what our forest cover looked like. But after independence, we started reclaiming the dry zone first through major uh, irrigation works like Galloya, Udawalawa, and then subsequently Mahavali, which uh, operated in this area, which has resulted in loss of nearly 50% of our forest cover. So uh, uh, the forest cover loss has been very rapid, uh, but it has uh, come down to some extent, but the fact is we are still losing roughly about 7,000 hectares annually. That is about three fourths of entire Singharaja forest, if you want to put a magnitude on it. So much of these forests are lost due to development projects, uh, major irrigation projects, road projects, settlement projects. These are resulting in reduction in the forest cover. So one of the biggest issues we have is reduction in forest means there is less habitat for species. So habitat loss is a serious issue. And also the second uh, major issue is habitat fragmentation. What I'm going to show you is, is a, a picture from uh, 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 Waunia area here. The, this dot indicates Waunia. Uh, what you will see next is uh, a more closer look at this area what you you'll see that this entire area has been under forest this is this photograph has been taken somewhere in 2006 during uh, or just before the the height of the northern war and then i'm going to show you a photo just after the war where we started developing the area and you can see that forest is being fragmented by all these are roads and these are all settlements agricultural landscapes so this shows the bigger issue where a big forest patch has now been broken down into little little pieces and this will continue to expand until the forest is almost gone so this is a kind of scenario that happens in sri lanka uh, in many places where we, we are seeing forests are fragmented and then they are completely lost now, what is the consequence of this? Uh, one of the issues now, if you take wet zone here, uh, wet zone has Sri Lanka's highest level of biodiversity. Most of the species that are found only in Sri Lanka, nearly 80% of them are in the wet zone. But if you look at the forest cover in wet zone, roughly about 3% of the land area of Sri Lanka. But these are our biodiversity repositories. This is Singaraja, this is Peak Villainous, this is Karnelia uh, Knuckles uh, complex. But what you see when you look at this forest cover is you have only very few large forest patches. Peak Villainous is one, uh, Knuckles range is another, uh, then Singaraja complex is, is another one. But we have lots of small, small fragmented forests. And when the forest size becomes less, it reduces the number of species they can support. So in many of these little forest patches, even though the habitat is there, most of the species that can live in those habitats are no more. They have become extinct from those forest patches. Birds like blue magpie, 
red faced maracoha or green bill cooker. You don't see them in these little forest patches, although the habitat is ideal for them to live in those forests. So that is one of the bigger issues we have with fragmentation. The forest size becomes smaller and smaller. And as a result, uh, a lot of these forests become uninhabitable by species that are critical to Sri Lanka. So that is uh, a bigger issue, loss of forest, forest fragmentation, and then also degradation. When once the forest becomes smaller, the larger trees are cut and the, the quality of the forest goes down. So all of these things contribute to another problem, which is conflict. This is one conflict we are having, a conflict with leopards. Uh, we have uh, the Wilderness and Wildlife Conservation Trust has recorded 79 uh, leopard deaths during the last decade alone. During 10 years, we have lost 79. 42 of them have died due to snares. You can see this beautiful uh, black leopard here, a panther. And this is a snare. It's caught in a snare and it has died due to uh, capturing the snare. You can see this one again, uh, it, it's been caught in a snare and you can see the cut on the neck. So basically, many of these uh, leopards are dying because in a fragmented landscape, they try to move between forest patches and during that process, they come into human use areas. They may take their dogs, maybe their cattle, and then people respond to them by setting up snares or uh, killing them in very, very brutal manner. So this is a bigger issue. This is another problem that we are facing today, the human elephant conflict. What you see here are two elephants electrocuted to death in the Galgamo area. We lose about 400 plus elephants annually. Now, that may seem like a small number, if you're talking about 400 human deaths out of a 21 million population, that is not a big number. But when you're losing 400 elephants out of a population of 6,000 elephants, that is very close to about 5% of the population dying every year. So these animals are very important to us. This is what brings the tourists to this country. These animals are extremely necessary for certain industries, especially the tourism industry. Yet we are losing them because uh, of the conflict. Uh, you also ask about uh, the, the birds, uh, same problem. Uh, especially you wanted me to talk about migratory birds. We have two kinds of migratory birds, birds that uh, live in wetlands and birds that live in forests. So when you have forest loss, it affects the forest migrants directly. Uh, also, we are converting many of our wetlands. So many of the wetland migrants are also seriously impacted by the way we are doing it. And you're asking me the question, why are we facing this? I'm showing you two pictures here. If you compare the two pictures, you will see they have pretty much the same elements. The only difference is how these elements are arranged. You can see here, the houses are everywhere. Trees are scattered and uh, schools are within this uh, mess, but the same thing can be rearranged in this manner. This is what is referred to as land use planning, where you keep people in, in one parcel, you have the forest and the river uh, undisturbed by human activities. This will allow animals to move around uh, and they will have habitat, so they will not come into conflict with people. So the main reason why I see uh, in Sri Lanka, why we are having all these issues is we, when we plan, we plan ad hoc. We don't really uh, take into consideration this very critical aspect of land, uh, maintaining landscape integrity uh, when we plan something. So as a result, we have conflict. And so we spend lots and lots of money on development but we are not accruing the benefits of it because the uh, because a conflict will have an impact on their cultivation and so on. So I think this is what we have to be thinking about. How do we make Sri Lanka a desirable nation to live in by properly planning our development? Even today, the issues we are having is all these forest losses, 
uh, are due to improper planning just ad hoc people are trying to develop some irrigation project in some location or trying to settle people in the middle of a forest and making them very vulnerable to attack by wild animals so uh, we have to rethink we have to think of a new paradigm how do we uh, plan our land our very limited land resources in a manner that will uh, help us to accrue maximum benefit out of nature, reduce conflict, and at the same time provide what is necessary for people. So I think that pretty much, I think, is, is my answer to your question. Thank you, Professor Devaka. That was really devastating to see all the resources and animals that we are losing because of this. We should take this into mind and um, try to change this into the better. Next up, um, we will move on to our next question, Himat. Thank you, Dinath. Um, Professor Balasur, being an architect, I'm sure your clients have shown interest on how you could incorporate methods on upholding biodiversity into their buildings or structures. Uh, we are aware that uh, building reservations to uphold biodiversity are implemented. Uh, uh, implemented in any, any structure. Uh, for example, the Clear Point Residencies, uh, an apartment in Sri Jayavardhana Purakote, which could soon call the world's tallest uh, vertical garden home with the unique sustainable development currently on the market in Sri Lanka. Tell us your opinion on how effective those reservations are enough to uphold biodiversity and what more should be implemented to uphold biodiversity of structures or buildings here in Sri Lanka. Um, most of the clients who are educated will actually trust the architects or the landscape architects to give their best solution. And uh, as we mentioned, Clear Point is a very good example where the architect Mirra Perera, the same project architect of Kandalama Hotel, um, used those principles, you know, and the clients are very happy. Most of the clients are happy. Some find it awkward because they have the creepy colleagues also coming into the plants and so forth but then that's a very few percentage. The rest are very happy because simply as the buildings get higher, the stress level also gets higher, okay? So you find that in many of the high-rise buildings, the, the contact with nature, the contact with plants is very important to reduce that stress. So the clear point residences do feel that when they are in their apartments, that they are on land simply because of the lovely large balcony with the plants and so forth, right? So I know of people who are there, extremely happy, and they get the best views as well of the city, as well as the plants that are just next to their lobby or their courtyard or their balcony, right? So these are possible solutions. And I think most people are, most architects are now going for those solutions. And the other example I also spoke about, Havelock City, how they're advertising the whole apartments because of the gardens they call it city in a garden or uh, you know so people are actually getting attracted because of the land that is there again lots of people don't realize that when they get out into this space which is a large landscape open space with huge trees uh, which have brought back biodiversity that it is actually on a car park okay so the possibilities are endless and then lots of roof gardens are coming up now where the roof is also used for planting. Then there's also creepers that are coming to cover the uh, heat stress of buildings. Lots of creepers that are grown. And you can see it in Colombo Courtyard at Patsunela, the other guests we were supposed to have. Uh, there's lots of uh, plants coming out to not only protect from the heat stress, but also give that feeling of green because um, health and well being is very much dependent on the green, right? You know, we need oxygen. And we need about rupees 44,000 uh, worth of oxygen per day per person, right? It is normally, it's free, okay? So it's so important that we have the trees. And if you have the tiniest space, if you can't have a large tree, even a small tree or shrubs are important. And again, as I was saying, you not exotic plants that need a lot of water and are not, are not drought resistant, but are native species, which will encourage butterflies and birds and become host for butterflies and birds, right? 
So it's very, very important that we recognize the fact that landscaping in areas of small footprint is important. And the type of plants that we incorporate is also important. So the whole mindset of people, the whole mindset of civic society must change as to what landscaping should be. Okay, they always think of exotic plants, flowering plants, lawns, pretty lawns that needs a lot of uh, maintenance, but it should not be the case. It should be like living inside a forest, but it is coming, like people are getting more educated. They understand the importance of forest. And there is also um, a terminology called forest bathing, right? If you have heard of sunbathing, I know. Sunbathing in the morning gives us the vitamin D, and you can see all the uh, foreign visitors love the sun, love the tropics because they are so deprived of the sun. So they love to come here and soak up the sun. We need the sun too. We need our vitamin D, okay? Rather than take a, a, a bottle full of tablets or vitamins, we can get it from nature. Also, so much of stress around the city, diabetes and non-communicable diseases like high blood pressure, all that can be reduced by gardens and parks and uh, from your own home garden, right? So the garden concept is so strong because it's going to be uh, benefit your health and well-being. And after all, health is wealth, right? So there's no point having lots and lots of fancy electronic gadgets if you don't have health, right? If you're obese, right? So apart from diet, healthy diet, which is also not in uh, this uh, forum, but a healthy diet is also important, right? As the youth of the country, you all must eat healthy, like not have lots of bread and buns and that kind of burgers and things. But a healthy diet with your ancestors, with your grandfather and grandmother, they actually had the healthy diet, right? So you all are quite, I think, fortunate. Our generation have enjoyed that. Your generation will also enjoy the biodiversity. But it is the generations to come that we have to consider. So you, the youth, must think of not short-term gain, but long-term, right? Like what the kings did when they actually built the reservoirs in the dry zone. Right? They are still benefiting from the reservoirs that they built, right? And I think it's very important. And people are conscious that we have to have the green, right? So cutting off a tree is very easy. It will take two minutes. But growing off a tree, that gives us oxygen, right? We take about 30, 25, 30 years, right? So definitely, yes. And I think architects and landscape architects are addressing it. People are more, more conscious. And I think the media also should help in this because I think the media has a huge part to play, you know? So if the youth can also address these issues with the media, where they promote the greening of the city, the greening of homes and, um, also using of native species, which is very important for biodiversity. Uh, Professor uh, Devaka spoke, spoke about fragmented fragmentation of forest, right? So if you actually have these green pockets uh, in the cities or in your homes that can act as uh, a continuity, um, a green corridor for wildlife as well. Okay, I think I answered that question. So more green, at all levels is a must. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah, we see a lot of uh, modern architects uh, taking this into consideration, especially around Colombo to, for their construction purposes. Uh, so moving on to our next question, Dina. Thank you, Himat. Um, the next question is for Professor Mahama. Um, we talked about how we can uphold biodiversity in a smaller scale, where we focus is on buildings. Um, Professor Mahanama, can you tell us how you can uphold biodiversity in a larger scale and what things are being implemented or should be implemented when planning the urban development of a whole country or, or a city? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your question. I, I think. Uh, I have to brief about this. Uh, Professor Devaka has mentioned uh, his last slide that uh, point out that uh, rearranging the space. That is the that is the planning. You know, normally we do uh, when you are rearranging, you understand the, all the elements. Uh, you know, systems uh, how they are because uh, and you say there's a concept called uh, 
ecosystem services. So we look at it in a system point of view. Uh, if you look at the any land, any space as a system, so that you can understand there are subsystems. So how they are interact with each other, they are interconnected, and uh, with understanding all this, we can rearrange the space to keeping all this you know integrated. So that is our normal approach. The, but I listened that Professor Balusiri mentioned about, the, and you are, you mentioned about the building, uh, about this uh, modern building and the, you know all this uh, new concept. The mind you, there is a big issue of the cost, it's very expensive. You know, it cannot be afforded by the major of the people. That was our issue actually. How can you provide the uh, you know, this is a business of real estate. All the problems of the environment nowadays in urban areas because of the, uh, it's called the, you know, it's like not demanded, it's like uh, created by the real estate developers. You know, you get a land and you develop and you sell it. But you can see how many buildings are fully occupied. They are not 100% occupied. You can see in the night, how many buildings you can see the lights are on. So there are a lot of vacant space. This is the common for all over the country. So in UK, there's a big problem because people are not occupied, but they are buying those land buildings. So what on what cost? There are people actually living it. Very difficult to find the big building and there are no support for those people. Those people are actually, what they do, they keep on clearing the land and expanding their you know, building. We call it urban sprawl, the biggest, the culprit of the whole business of urban sprawl. That means we are encroaching the forest land, agriculture land, paddy land, and keep on expanding our cities towards the horizontally, not the vertical. I agree, we need the vertical development. That means the compact in certain location and keep the uh, rest of the area free for people to you know, get other services. That's I think various concepts are there. But when you want to improve the biodiversity, uh, the cities, first I mentioned that earlier, you can understand what are the major elements that you can find in the, your urban area, basically whatever city, the country. As Professor mentioned, they mentioned about the forest is one aspect. You know, when you are cities located, the settlement located near the forest. So what do you understand? What is, first we have to understand, uh, study the, what are the services that provide that for us provide the society? Ecosystem services it has a various services, as you know, it provide food, uh, you know, fencing the environment and protecting various aspects and supporting the wildlife. All aspect has to be studied, and that should be done by the proper, you know, professional person on, on this ecologist or somebody in the forest person. So we have to understand. We have they have to give us. This is the area that you must you know, keep the reservation you know, area for that particular element. Then we know that how to integrate that with the rest of the development. So that is the normal, normal, the proper way of doing planning or supporting the maintain the biodiversity. I can give an example because I got involved some time back in one of the projects, you know, very hot topic nowadays, the Muturajala, you know, you own a Muturajala marsh area. I think uh, Professor they also get involved I actually, because uh, when I was in the, I mean, it's still in academic, but I am not in administration now because that time I got involved in preparing a master plan for uh, Muturajas, 1991, 92 period. So this is a, you can remember, you can look at the history of the Muturajas. And 1966, uh, there, there was a proposal to completely reclaim the entire area, you know, entire marsh area, develop 66,000 housing units. That was the original first proposal came in 1966. For that purpose, the government has created the Institute for Land Reclamation and Development Board. You know, that board actually, that time, we don't talk about, nobody in the world talk about the wetlands. They thought wetlands are the wasteland. You know, they are lands which are, cannot be used anything. Therefore, it is better to reclaim. That's you can see in Maliga, the Palambo. That entire settlement came on, the, built on the reclaimed land. So this is, there's a separate organization that main mandate to reclaim land. 
So it was the up to now. Now they have converted. Now it's land and development corporation. Now it's remove the reclamation park. But their main job is to reclaim, and their living is actually based on the their earnings. So that that's plan was there was a proposal. Then after that there's another proposal. Then 1991 we did a plan that was had a first thing we did actually is a developer ecological profile. So. Anybody talk about Mutra Ajala in isolation is a total mis. Uh, we are not, I mean, it's not the proper. So we have to think about connecting Mutra Ajala and Nigabulago together as one system because they are interdependent. You know, Mutra Ajala and Nigabulago, there's a large stretch. So they are interconnected, there is functioning, there are a lot of functional importance, and there are a network, river network, coming water coming into Lagoon and through the marsh. And then we found that, then finally we decided, very broad land use plan. And we found that most southern part of the Mutura Jela is already being built, you know, gradually reclaimed, even naturally, is dying. So they are less significant in terms of biodiversity habitat. Most significant biodiversity habitat found in the in between. Uh, Nigambu Lagoon and the marsh, they are the transition area. So that area earmarked as large area, remaining marsh area, the important area, as a conservation area and gathered by Wildlife Conservation Department. So then that is, there were boards and they put everything and they the gathered and given to the land Wildlife Conservation Department to preserve as an important wetland. So what happened after that? So various development, you know, as Earlier mentioned, Professor Dev also ad hoc vision. They change the plan. They they wanted to have something, they do it. So these are the problems actually. The issue we can support. There are probably only thing you know decision making. There are some show, some issues. Basically, uh, you understand we have rules, regulation, rule, everything. The enforcement are very poor. So you know that Nikambulagun. What happened? Nikambulagun. Nikambulagun is now. Under severe threat, you know, it's a reclamation. There's a natural landfilling also taking place because there's still a lot of silt load coming into the lagoon. It's like, you know, at that time we estimate about 6,000 tons per year, silt load coming in. Why is the silt coming? Because up, up, you know, upstream of the river is now clearing up for housing, building, forest clearance, everything that brings the silt. So this is a serious issue. So these are actually, but what you, how can you uh, correct this? Only thing, what we know, we need to assign the activity on each and every parcel of the land, some activity, and have to be, you know, say, if you want to identify the important area as, you know, rearrange the space and, you know, put that where the settlement come, that settlements have to be legally, you know, put on that. That other country develop, you know, when you take the, Melbourne City, Malmo City, the best cities you can find. All of cities are well planned, well done. And they are not like this, you know, that type of ad hoc development won't come here. They know how to develop. That's, that's I think, that way we can support this uh, biodiversity protection. Then you have the biodiversity area there, they can, you know, habitat is protected. Their interaction, they don't cross over other areas because they need water, food, and they are living, uh, you know, the roosting area, whatever they are, they are all available in that particular area. They don't want to cross the, the human settlement area. Then, then you can integrate, then you can have a certain activities on that particular area, to tourism, bird weaving, watching, and everything. A lot of things are there that can be integrated. I think that plans are there, all of this plan. Only thing, you know, implementing the policy makers, even the decision makers, they don't take it seriously. The issue is actually not you and my issue because we are actually professional. We do all this support. So why what's the problem? Now you can see this is really the political issue. So that how do you address? In your time, in your, your period, you must understand we had a kind of, uh, <clears throat> we need a mindset uh, change, young stage, even you must understand uh, because we have a kind of an education we always uh, focus on two a specialty, engineering and medicine, very good water. There are other disciplines also, very important. So 
as medicine and engineering. So you must learn and get the this various other, other knowledge also required to you know which generates to how to support this uh, preserving or conserving the biodiversity. That's very important. I think uh, the answer is that we need a very strong approach, integrated approach with all the aspects. We have need the it should be a more professional rather than ad hoc. You know, that is very important. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We we totally agree with your point. We uh, we hope that we can learn from our mistakes and move forward with this issue. Um, Himat. Thank you, Dina. Uh, so as we all know, the whole world, gosh, has been affected with the deadly virus, uh, the coronavirus that has had a, had a huge negative impact on human lives as well as many industries. But we were able to see that the environment and wildlife has regained its space shockingly compared with the state that it was uh, prior to the virus. Uh, Professor Verakon, I would like to direct this question to you. Uh, tell us your opinion on how COVID-19 affected wildlife. Let me just pull up a few slides just to share with you uh, what we have seen. Uh, uh, just give me one second here. So when you uh, take COVID-19, one of the main things that happened was uh, we were made immobile uh, because uh, various uh, reasons have made people immobile, maybe at a local or regional level. But COVID-19 was a pandemic that has uh, immobilized the whole world. Uh, for a few months. So what you see here is how the mobility has changed across the world uh, that uh, most people ended up spending uh, at homes for two, three months uh, and the whole uh, air fleets were grounded. Uh, and then what was the effect that this had? Now what you see here is a thing called jet streaming. Uh, when you see a, a, a plane flying, it leaves behind a, a water vapor trail, which is called a jet stream. Uh, so what we have seen is that the aviation sector uh, has come to a complete standstill. Uh, and this, this has reduced amount of uh, global greenhouse gas emission today because aviation sector contributes roughly about three to 5% of carbon dioxide emissions because they are high fuel using industry. And also it has resulted in a massive reduction in contrails, which cleared the air. Just to show some uh, uh, how the, uh, the atmosphere changed, what you see here uh, is how the, uh, the NASA uh, pollution centers have picked up uh, how the atmosphere has changed over China. What you see in, in this, uh, picture here is the nitrogen dioxide levels in the northeastern China. Uh, the darker brown indicates a very high level, uh, yellow indicates uh, sort of like a mid-level, and bluish green means it's pretty clear. And you can see January 1, 2020, just before the shutdown of China, and by February, this entire area has cleared up. That is the change that has brought uh, in, in, in China. Same thing in India. What you see here is the, the, the dust levels, how, because in the Northern India, there is a lot of farming. And so before they farm, they burn their, they, they, they clear their land, burn it, resulting in massive uh, dust clouds and, and uh, smoke clouds. And you can see, uh, if, if you compare this area, this is 2014, 2016, 2019, and this is during COVID, a very, very clear sky. So the, the impact of human beings, uh, and this is again in the Venice area, the very, very famous Venice area where you have uh, it's a beautiful town. You have lots of, the Venice is famous for its boats. And you can see this is uh, 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 
uh, in 2019 when Venice was in full swing. And you can see this is during COVID. You can see this is the main canal of the Venice. So you can see it's full of boats. And here you can see the canal has cleared. And you can see a lot of boat traffic going between these islands. All of them have cleared and the water has become completely cleared. You could see fish swimming in water. That is the, the change we have seen. And what this change tells us is that we are having a significant impact on the environment. We are changing the atmosphere. We are changing the water. We are uh, changing a lot of things on this planet which are not sustainable. But the unfortunate thing is this only lasted for a very short period. Even if you look at Sri Lanka, all our wildlife parks were closed. So animals had a free run for a few months without being disturbed by people, without jeeps rushing at them uh, just to see a leopard or an elephant. So they were free to roam uh, uh, in those protected areas for a few months. But now we have coming to almost a post-COVID scenario. We are now going back at the environment with a new vigor, trying to overcome the socioeconomic problems we are facing due to COVID, we are trying to develop things fast. And, and even if you look at our, our response to COVID, we are using so many masks. And if you look at all these masks end up uh, in garbage dumps, some of them get washed into water, into oceans, and they will have an impact on animals. So COVID gave a very temporary uh, period of uh, uh, a period of uh, respite for animals or wildlife per se. But I think what we do in the post-COVID era is going to be even more detrimental. We see this after every disaster. When tsunami came, we saw that the tsunami caused some devastation, but our efforts to rebuild after tsunami caused even bigger devastation to the environment. So I think these are lessons we have to learn. These are lessons we have to keep in our minds that uh, you know, okay, we are going through a pandemic, we are going through some serious economic problems, but the solution to that is not try to develop at the by compromising the environment. At least we must learn that we have a very strong footprint on this planet, but we can change our ways. If we don't change our ways, I don't think we have learned a lesson uh, from this pandemic we are facing. So I think we have to start thinking uh, of doing things slightly differently than the way we are doing now. I think that is the, the lesson I learned from this pandemic. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we learned a lot about what happened, uh, how COVID affected the environment. And uh, we saw the vast change 